Hi, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network podcast. In case you're not familiar with us, the Sacred Inclusion Network is a group of folks that are actively exploring the integration of what people call diversity and spirituality. If you want to know more about us, please visit our website, sacredinclusion.com. Today, it's my treat to interview Ryan Hurd, who's a dream researcher, educator, and author. Ryan is the author of several books on dreams and nightmares, and he's the editor of dreamstudies.org. He also currently serves, this is the greatest title in the world, as a director of spiritual development at the Unitarian Society of Germantown in Philadelphia, PA, and he's an adjunct lecturer at John F. Kennedy University. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. You know, Ryan, I generally ask people to begin with their sort of spiritual and um, religious upbringing, but I'm going to skip that and go to a different different direction. I was browsing a lot of your um, materials, and um, you talked about your first um, lucid dream, and it really struck a chord with me because it wasn't all peaches and cream, it didn't sound like, you know? Um, I mean, and it, it kind of reminded me of an early experience that I've had that I, I, I don't think about very often, but um, when I was really young, I used to literally wake up in a dream, and I was, I was in a, a kind of a claustrophobic subway or something, or a trolley car. You, you know, Philadelphia, you have trolley cars, and I would literally have to go to sleep to wake up um, in, in, in so-called in IRL, in real life, you know, and this was a repetitive dream. You know, so anyway, what was your, tell me a little bit about your first um, lucid dream experience. Sure. And maybe first I should define what lucid dreaming you should, is. because I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the term myself, please. Yeah, so, so it's a dream experience at night and it's the lucid part is that one has the awareness that you're dreaming. So in the dream itself, hey, this is a dream. I'm dreaming right now. And from there... One can make choices or, um, you know, decide, hey, I'm going to leave this scene and go fly up into the air um, and do other kinds of things uh, within that dream template or even just be more present to the dream as the dream unfolds. So what you do with the dream really is dependent. But the main po- important thing is that that meta consciousness, that awareness so for myself, it was a nightmare. Yeah, it was a nightmare. Um, and this is pretty common, I think, with, with uh, youth. Uh, and for me, I was having a repetitive nightmare based on the movie Poltergeist, uh, which I saw too early as a child, thanks to the bad babysitter. <laughs> bad babysitter took me to see Poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case i was having lots of i don't know if you know this is dating me but you know the movie itself there's this uh you know monsters come out of the television sets that that's like a portal to this sort of demonic other world and in the dream i was having a, a interaction with a tentacled creature that was sort of frothing and coming out of the television and at that moment, I realized I was dreaming that this was that this was a dream, and that and that to a certain degree that this monster did not need to be feared. And so I basically said no. I said no. This I'm not going to allow this to happen anymore. And just that that uh, resistance, that sacred no, I guess you could say, uh, uh, caused the, the monster to just suck back into the television and and to go and just go away. And then I woke up, and so that was my that was my first dream was basically to be able to uh, to take some ownership for my experience and and my boundaries and say no. Uh, so yeah, and from there, of course, I had numerous nightmares after that as a child, um, and lucidity would come. Uh, it was part and parcel of my nightmare experience, and it wasn't always about you know making the stuff go away, but but being able to take to have courage in facing it. And I think that's the larger theme. We're going to get practical in a bit, but I remember I was reading, um, I think it was the introduction of one of your books, Lucid, and you describe a period in your late teens and early 20s when you had what you called a spiritual opening, where you experienced repetitive lucid dreams, or you had them often. Can you describe what happened and maybe how it propelled you to become a dream researcher? 
Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So nightmares were a part of my childhood for sure. And I was also at the same time having a lot of ecstatic spiritual experiences uh, with my lucid dreams. I considered lucid dreaming to be as a pathway to the divine, even when I was a teenager, uh, because I was having also white light experiences and um, other, you know, flying up into the air, into the cosmos, uh, very transpersonal. Um, And so, and then on the other side, I was having still lots of these 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 dreams that I would now consider initiation dreams of a sort where I was being tested confronted by malevolent forces experiencing pain witnessing suffering lots of stuff I couldn't control um, and that would eventually I would awaken from and so it was a nightmare in the classic sense where a nightmare is a dream that we are a you know, we wake up from because of fear or dread or terror. Uh, And so anyway, as a young adult, I was having these, having these dreams as well. And it, it caused me to do what I think a lot of people do when they don't have support in the dreaming arts, which is just to stop trying to dream. And I went almost in the opposite direction. And I was at that time in college. And I was already a religion studies um, minor and doing creative writing, and I moved into studying anthropology and archaeology, almost as in a way to say, I want to study the most grounded subject possible. <laughs> right? I want to, I want to count, count pottery shards for a while and just like be on the material realm. And so that's, and that's what I did. And for a number of years, I, uh, after college, I worked as a field archaeologist and in laboratories, um, mostly in the south, southeastern United States. And I took some travels as well doing that kind of work. Uh, and what I found is after I basically got grounded, the lucidity in these dreams came back, but this time I felt more balanced and I was ready to... Um, ready to face them again. And I felt like I had more sort of internal, internal resources for these, these, these tactics. And that's when I also realized I need external help as well. I need mentors who have been in these realms and um, can, can help guide me. So that's what led me into grad school, of course, in California, uh, where I went to school for consciousness studies with a heavy focus on dream research and dream work. And I was, it was a delightful time uh, in the early 2000s in San Francisco and the Bay Area where there was a lot of dream workers and dream researchers um, who were coming together. They all were studying at different universities, but they'd come together. And I learned from some of just some luminaries in the field. Uh, it was a wonderful time. You know, um, we're going to get into into that a little bit. I mean, into your dream work, but I'm I'm fascinated by your early career as an archaeologist, and you know, you describe um, things like going to sacred sites and having dreams in sacred sites. And um, you know, I remember as a as a young person being being fascinated by sacred archaeology, for example. Uh, maybe you could talk about a little bit about the bridge between being an archaeologist and being a dream worker. And maybe some of your experiences doing lucid or dreaming anyway in uh, in sacred sites. Sure. So I mean, the way that I look at it is is that in in both of these uh, studies, you're you're pursuing buried treasure, um, but <laughs> with the dream work it's it's mental and 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 I find that the riches are more valuable. Uh, for and also, I still am now in my mid forties, and I still have a working uh, b- backbone and working knees. Unlike a lot of my colleagues who stayed in the field of archaeology, they're all getting knee replacements at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so there were some practical concerns as well, but uh, but no, seriously, the um, and of course that that material grounding was uh, critical for me to get my bearing and to, to kind of help me develop what I would guess call almost a mystical existentialism as a viewpoint um, where I am very much um, interested in the history of, of sacred sites, the history of how people experience the divine and build environments to, 
to both display this as well as aggregate the natural power that some places have. Uh, and, and of course, in dreaming is a altered state of consciousness that can be used at these particular sites to continue to pursue experiences with, you know, the more than other, the divine, the transpersonal. And so I, you know, my continued, I would say, um, just interest really uh, is as an amateur is, is looking and going to and finding sacred sites and, and exploring them as well as the, this interesting subfield of sleep archaeology that's kind of beginning to, to show up where people are noticing archaeologists uh, uh, who you know, work in universities are, are noticing and cataloging that there's more to some of these sacred sites than was really realized and that they are, some of them are actually places and temples specifically for doing certain kinds of sacred rest or sacred sleep. Hmm. Yeah, I remember you, you, I didn't get into it in in depth, but I remember you mentioning you were, excuse me, you were in Nicaragua and you you were, you, and while you were doing your your actual field work, um, you were actually, you know, dreaming. And, um, you know, and and that, it gave you some practical insight into certain things, right? I mean, it wasn't just like, you know, you were just going in woo-woo land. It actually helped you (laughs) in terms of your, in terms of your actual archaeology, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I was in Nicaragua for uh, for a month and I was helping out on um, a project for um, a, a researcher, uh, Suzanne Baker, Dr. Suzanne Baker, who was finishing uh, her dissertation, which was on the uh, prehistoric rock art of Ometepe Island, which is a uh, volcanic island in the middle of Lake Nicaragua. And it's just an, a beautiful place that's covered with basaltic boulders that are carved with all kinds of intricate uh, geometric and animal zoomorphic as well as human forms all over the island. The whole island's a sacred site. Uh, and so I was helping as a volunteer um, go through and, 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 and find some of these and, and map and graph uh, some more of these, these, these artifacts. And in my spare time, um, I was incubating dreams. And so I had a sort of a, just my own research project for myself, which was trying to incubate or to call, you know, incubate means to call a dream about the rock art I was experiencing during the day. And I was like, well, what is this, what does this, uh, look like in my own dream world? And, and is there anything that these experiences in my dream world can help me reflect on what my waking experiences are like? And so in that time, I had probably, I recorded over 100 dreams for wow. the, three, the three weeks that I was on Ometepe Island. It was, three, it was over 100 dreams. Uh, and about 10 of them were lucid dreams in which I remembered that that when I became lucid, that my goal was to look for rock art or have rock art show up. And so I got to view uh, Ometepe rock art in my own mental space. And those were very kind of trippy experiences um, that turned out to have some really interesting, yeah, just kind of almost commentaries on my own perception, as well as they brought out the anomalies of my perceptions that I tended to disregard in my waking, rational, normal, archaeological mindset. And so I found that the, the dreams actually helped me be a better field archaeologist. They helped me be more attuned to um, anomalous perceptions in the field. And so that's, and I wrote a paper about that, and I presented that at a couple of conferences. And, and basically, the larger thread of that is how anybody, whether you're a scientist or um, an ethnographer or any kind of field of study, one can use dreams to help reawaken uh, intuitive ways of being. And that can become part of the data that we bring in. And it's sort of injecting the researcher back into the research. And um, mm-hmm. allowing, you know, uh, allowing the world to be alive and for us to be a part of it. Yeah, um, uh, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's interesting. It's nice to hear that people are still doing that sort of work. You talk dream archaeology. I mean, wow, you know, um, it's sort of 
we have this notion that our, our, our waking life is completely separate from our dream life. And I would imagine that to some extent, all of your, your, your life is about how, how, how help, helping people integrate those two things and see that they're on, on some level one thing. Would that be a fair um, assessment? Yeah, I think that's really fair. And, and part of that is realizing that we're, that in waking life, we're not as lucid as we think we are. <laughs> So it's certainly true. <laughs> so it's waking up to um, to the dream of waking life as well, and um, being able to just appreciate the ups and downs of um, of consciousness uh, throughout our day. And and this is very a very practical thing. I think that even comes down to how we are in our work lives, in our busy in our busy lives, about giving ourselves time to um, daydream. Um, because there's times during the day that our minds essentially that we go into a dreamlike state and, um, and we tend to deny those urges, uh, but that's very important creative thinking and, and almost in rest and creative resting that's, that's happening in those moments. But what we tend to do is try to go for the coffee, uh, when we notice that our attention is slipping. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm part of this. I absolutely notice these same, you know, these same tendencies in myself. And so I think that's one of the things that we can do to become more intuitive is to be just simply more observant of our own waxing and waning awareness throughout the day as we go through, uh, you know, wakefulness and high perception, you know, thinking to more disordered, creative, imaginal ways of being and to honor that by giving ourselves the space to do so. Well, I know that um, my sense is that you've used your dream work or your own personal dream work as a way to understand your spirituality, your own spirituality. Um, Can you um, tell me a little bit about that and maybe how you have maybe some um, tangible things? Sure. I mean, it's it's interesting. I um, I've used my lucid dreams, especially when I was younger. I was very much um, interested in having lots of transpersonal experiences, and um, I was really into the experiences of light that can occur in dreams. Um, that was something that I was seeking, <clears throat> and at times uh, that seeking was was balanced. And other times I think I was, it was not balanced. There are times I think that I was, you know, the term spiritual bypass, uh, where we seek transpersonal ecstatic experiences when we're not grounded and essentially we're avoidance of real life. And I definitely fell into that camp from time to time. I remember one particular lucid dream where I went blasting off into the cosmos to look for God literally, uh, in my dream. And, and, and by the way, so I have a Unitarian Universalist background, which is to say that uh, I have a, a very open sense of what the divine is, and even did at this time that I was probably 17 or 19 years old, and I had this particular dream. And so I blasted off into, into my dream sky to look for, to look for God. And and I found a cloud, and then suddenly peering over the cloud down at me was this white man with a beard, and he, he kind of peered down at me and said, Ha! <laughs> I woke up, and that was the joke, because... <laughs> 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 That's not how you do it. That's not how you go about it. And, you know, I personally do not think that God is embodied by a bearded white man you know, in a cloud. And so it was just a way of showing me that, hmm, maybe there's some other ways to go. And, and research actually bears this out. Um, there's some interesting research on seeking the divine lucid dreams done by uh, an artist and researcher named Fariba Bogzaran. She lives in California. And she found that that she did a number of phenomenological studies asking people about their lucid dreams and how they sought the divine. And and she found that those who had more of a surrender pose rather than an active seeking pose had more what she would call positive outcomes in terms of they felt like they learned something new about 
either the universe or themselves. Whereas those who took this active, like almost like I'm hunting the divine type of um, attitude had, had more likely to find something expected or in my case, almost like uh, the trickster, you know? Um, So almost like resistance to um, something larger rather than something being revealed. And so this is just to say that as we go about our lives, whether in dreams or waking light, and we're looking for experiences of the divine, sometimes it's about, about having, being able to hold a forum to allow the divine to express itself rather than trying to, to seek it. That's sort of like the expression, when the student, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I'm curious. Have you had any, have you had any um, dream mentors, um, teachers that you've met in dreams? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I have. I have, and sometimes they are individuals who don't come back. And then I have had a couple of of characters who have shown up at different times in my life, uh, and I'm realizing, oh, that's the same lucid character. Um, there's one particular person who shows up and only speaks in Latin, um, which is unfortunate because (laughs) 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 because my Latin is not so good. Um, uh, and, and there's, but sort of a, uh, variation on that character has come and spoken in English and I've noticed not often, but throughout the years that he's been there and is almost a reflective or a witness, um, doesn't necessarily tell me anything, but will be there as I go through an experience uh, and might sometimes pose a question. So one particular dream that's coming to mind right now was uh, I was lucid in a dream and I was wandering about and when I suddenly was attacked by a couple of a couple of ferocious dogs in my dream, and they were they're tearing at me, they're biting my hands, which by the way is a big i think a spiritual symbol of sorts um, when animals bite at your hands, um, the mouth itself being sort of an, an, a sacred a sacred uh, symbol. Um, for knowledge um, and um, maybe even shamanic uh, power. And so these dogs were biting at me and it was painful and um, and I start fighting back. And this is when I noticed this mentor figure uh, who was close to me and sort of watching and he looks at me and I don't know if he said it or whether it was just like one of those telepathic things or it's the way he looked at me. But what he said was, "Is is this what you want? You know, is this the way? And so I, I, I changed my, my tact in the dream and I stopped fighting the dogs back. I just basically surrendered to it. And the dogs immediately stopped fighting me and transformed into, into sort of calm puppies. Wow. And, and at that same time, my consciousness shifted and became much more clear and calm. And so the change of the imagery was happening simultaneously with the shift of my own perception and the quality of my own consciousness. Uh, you know, I could ask you about dream experiences forever, um, but I think I ought to get practical for our listeners here. Um, I'm sure there's a number of people that are wondering, well, you know, this sounds great. How do I get involved with threading my dreams? You also mentioned to me that there's a number of different ways of doing that. So if, you, if somebody asks you, Ryan, how how can I get started working with my dreams? What what do you tell such a person? Well, the the main thing is to is to work on dream recall. I think Um, we know we dream pretty much every night, uh, but we don't remember our dreams most of them. Um, And once we begin remembering more dreams, what happens is is that is that they begin to clarify the dreams themselves that we remember begin to clarify, uh, and so they they t- we tune towards them they tune towards us, and so working in dream recall is essentially the first step of uh, making dreaming a spiritual practice, and and the easiest and the best way to do so would be to grab a dream journal of some kind, 
a notebook and it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but I would recommend if no one, if you've never done this before to have this notebook be just for dreams and nothing else. Uh, and keep it at your bedside table and let it be the last thing you see as you go to sleep and, and, and remind yourself when I wake up, I'm going to ask myself, what did I just experience? What just happened? And so you essentially make a cognitive habit out of asking this question once you wake up. Um, and also, it's important to make a little bit of space upon awakening for the recall of dreams. And so it doesn't take a lot of time, um, but if you already are using an alarm to wake up, you could make that first time that you snooze, because we're all probably snoozing anyway, to, to rather than try to conk back out, to just lay there and reflect what just happened and see if we can still feel the dream, notice the dream. And, and, and if there, nothing comes to mind, sometimes just being there, uh, it'll come back, it'll come flooding back. The feeling of it, maybe even just an image, a single image can come back. And so, and so to, just to be immerse oneself in those feelings for a number of minutes and see what comes. And then from that point, you have something that you can write down. Um, whether you just do a couple of scraggly notes upon awakening, then you can flesh it out perhaps later in the day to get into a, some kind of routine or habit about writing the dreams down because that is really what seems to make a big difference in terms of uh, remembering more dreams and, and, and basically inviting them to come back. And so that's, that's, the, that's the number one thing I think that helps all kinds of dream work is, is increasing their recall. And you mentioned um, that there's several different ways of working with dreams. The, the, what the commonly people think of dream interpretation as the, as the other thing. You mentioned in our conversation just now um, was the word uh, calling forth a dream. And mm. I've also heard about dream reenactment. Um, can you talk about different ways that people can work with dreams? Yeah. So, so one of the interesting things that happens once you begin recalling more dreams and become more conscious of your dream life is – is that you'll see how dreams are responding to what's going on with you emotionally um, in life. <clears throat> so even though we're dreaming about things like our childhood home and high school and sort of sometimes really ancient memories, uh, there's something about it. Why is this dream happening now? What's being stirred up now? And that's what Jeremy Taylor, who is a dream worker who he passed on a couple of years ago, he would always ask that question, why this dream now? Uh, and so, and so that's the next step out of that is to realize that I can actually focus a question about what do I wish my dream life to work on? And then the dream can respond. And so that's called dream incubation. Uh, and there's, um, there's entire sort of traditions that used to be, um, around in archeological traditions, I would, I would add, uh, that focus on dream healing that would use this, uh, very, very simple, common human ability. And, and so dreams aren't just random. We can basically go to sleep with an intention or a question or ask, for, ask for guidance on a particular topic. And it always works best with those topics that have emotional salience, right? Those topics that um, are of the heart. Um, now, it doesn't mean it can't be creative and work-related because if, if you're heavily invested, for instance, in making something, a project happen, then it is of the heart. Uh, but it, it's really, it's really is best when it's intellectual and, and heart-focused. And ask that question before going to sleep as drifting off to sleep. And even if you wake up in the middle of the night, it's even more effective. Uh, and then while you're drifting back into sleep, ask the question again, because uh, the second half of the night, we tend to have more remembered dreams anyway. And so, and then recall those dreams that do come in the next, I'd say the next, um, the next week or so. Uh, and, and there's generally a response. There's gen not necessarily an answer. I mean, because this comes to one's own philosophical concerns about what a dream is. Um, <clears throat> I see dreaming life and waking life as part of, of a, you know, a continuity of, of the creative mind and, and of possibilities and of play. 
And so it's not necessarily going to be the answer, but it can be some playful possibilities about ways around this issue or perhaps just some new perspective. Uh, I think a fair question that some some people might ask is this, this sounds like a lot of work, Ryan. And, um, you know, it, 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 what you described is a process. It's not like you, you just all of a sudden you, you, you open a notebook, you write down a dream and it's over. It's something that you basically, it's a process that you, you have to have a belief that there's going to, going to be some value in it for you. So I guess a simple question is, um, I, you, I'm sure you use dreams as ways to solve practical problems. Can you give our audience some example of how you've done that um, and how you might perhaps have used dream incubation to answer a life question? Yeah, sure. Um, so here's a, a more recent one. Um, as you mentioned in the beginning, I'm serving right now as director of spiritual development uh, for this uh, congregation in Philadelphia. And so I'm in charge of education, essentially. It's a very fancy title, but I'm in charge of education. So when this job became uh, open and I was considering, should I apply for the job? I incubated on um, that. I, I asked my dream life, should I take this job? Should I apply for this job? Um, knowing how much work it's going to be to go through and how many panels I'm going to have to sit <laughs> through. <laughs> how many committees I'm going to have to answer to. So, so I, uh, I did that and I had a series of dreams over the next week that basically gave me a yes, you should, you should at least try. And one of those dreams that I'll reveal was uh, a dream in which I was in a church. And in the church, there was a little alcove on the wall, like uh, a little uh, reset, a recessed place. And I found a box. And in the dream, I opened the box. And inside it, it was covered in soil. Uh, and there's my archaeological background always. And in, I, in the soil, I found a statue of a saint. And I pulled the saint out of the, out of the box. And it, it just was like this fresh discovery. Uh, and I woke up from that dream feeling like I had reconnected with something very old with, my, with myself. And I said, oh, my gosh, this has to do with the question I asked. Clearly, that this is perhaps that this job would be an opportunity uh, for me to revisit, um, you know, my own uh, spiritual explorations within, within um, a church, which is something that I had not done for decades. Wow. So that so that's a very that's a personal one. Um, but people also, I would say, you know, do this for for questions about um, mathematics uh, and and co you know, one of the founders of Google apparently got at, was was crunching code and came up with the search algorithm in a dream. The actual the actual code itself, he put it in and it worked. Uh, and wow. so there's, you know, there is um, some very interesting creative problem solving uh, dreams throughout history that have been of this nature. And if you're interested in that, there's a wonderful book called The Committee of Sleep by Dr. Deirdre Barrett, uh, who is a professor at Harvard, who's sort of cataloged these, all these wonderful stories of scientists and inventors and artists who have used their dreams directly. And she has an inc dream incubation uh, uh, procedure that she teaches in the book as wow. well. Ryan, I could talk to you forever, but um, I'm wondering, g give me some sense as to what you're interested in now. What, what are your, some of your real research interests? I know you've been doing some research on this. I'm, I'm going to pronounce it wrong on this substance that people use to um, help induce lucid dreams, but what are you interested in now? What yeah. Some, so what's cutting edge for you right now? Uh, I'm interested in lucid nightmares still. It's something that uh, is a thread of my uh, research has kind of gone on throughout my whole life. And so, yeah, I have some colleagues um, through the International Association for the Study of Dreams who I'm working with on a clinical study of using the supplement called galantamine uh, to to in, invoke vivid dreams. And so we've done some previous studies on this topic with placebos and basically really we're able to show, yes, galantamine 
you know, actually does have an interesting effect on dreams for people. It's a safe supplement that you can take that's legal, uh, that basically allows for longer, more vivid dreams. But it also seems to have this effect where it allows disturbing material perhaps to come up. Some of these dreams are, um, are they're vivid and bizarre, bizarre being sort of a catch-all phrase for crazy and, and perhaps even scary. Uh, and so, and at the same time, even though it's inducing these, these dreams, the people, as they reflect back how their dream experiences were, they say it wasn't overwhelming. So it's possible that galantamine might be a kind of psycho integrator of sorts um, in a mild sense in that it is invoking, um, stir, you know, stirring the pot basically, but providing a, a safe container uh, to bring up material to the, to the, to the mind uh, through dreaming. And so we've been trying to get some uh, people who suffer from nightmare disorders PTSD um, uh, to, to be part of the study with us. And it's slow going. Uh, we still don't have enough, quite enough uh, subjects at this point yet to, to go with it, but we've, we've, we've got enough to at least start. And so that's, that's been pretty exciting to be part of that process. All this is fascinating, Ryan. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to you in a minute formally, um, but I'm, I want to just Tell our listeners if they want to know something about the network, how they can get in touch with you, all these kind of things. The, the, I guess the first thing about Ryan, he's got this wonderful website. He's got several websites, but the, the main one is maybe one of the main ones is dreamstudies.org. Um, he's got a mailing list so you could get yourself involved in the world of, of Ryan Hurd. You know, uh, he's got books. He's got a lot of stuff going on. So those of you that are interested in our, our Sacred Inclusion Network, there's a couple of ways you can get involved. Um, the simplest way is to join our private Facebook group. Um, look for Sacred Inclusion on Facebook. We also have um, the third Saturday of every month, we have what we call online community explorations. Various guests lead us in different things. You can find information about that by going to our website. And if you want to support our podcast, you can do so on Patreon. Um, Go to patreon.org, look for Diversity and Spirituality, which is our former name, and you can do that. Ryan, this is just wonderful stuff. Uh, I'm just, um, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going get, to get into my own dream journal. I had one for many years, and I've let it go, and you're, you've motivated me to get started again. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so thank you for being my guest. Yes, thanks for having me.